for actually the, the second time uh, this month, uh, Dr. Fauci was called to a higher calling and uh, is unable to uh, uh, speak. He's very enthusiastic of demystifying medicine and has participated virtually every year. But we are very grateful that uh, he suggested that David Morins, who's his senior advisor, uh, he's the director, as you know, of NIAID, uh, and that Dr. Morins would uh, present uh, his work and uh, his analysis of this challenging problem of uh, emergence of infectious diseases. Um, the more one thinks about the sort of the big biological picture of infectious diseases, maybe as you get older too, you realize that this is the great war uh, that uh, civilization and animals of all kinds have been fighting probably since uh, the beginning of the mitochondrion from bacteria. Uh, and it's a war where sometimes we're winning and sometimes we're losing. There was a period uh, in the antibiotic era when very knowledgeable people, leaders in the field of infectious diseases, uh, said that virtually infectious disease was something we could almost uh, forget about. Um, of course, uh, the bugs, the viruses, <laughs> are probably going to win out in the end anyway because they have extraordinary capacity uh, to undergo constant evolution and change. So there's the constant battle between what we can do in a reductionist sense, basic science, if you will, and in a public health sense, the bigger picture of uh, mankind and society, uh, there's a great deal that is continuously uh, ebbing and flowing. And it's punctuated by periodic outbreaks, uh, some devastating HIV, uh, some of shorter duration, perhaps, we hope, uh, like occasional outbreaks of diseases like Ebola and uh, MERS, SARS. But there are always influenza. But there always is the fact that it's not going to go away. And to uh, protect, if there is such a thing to do, to detect, uh, to protect against it, uh, requires commitments that go way beyond just what can be done in a short time period. Societal commitments, global commitments. At any rate, this huge picture is one in which David Morins has been uh, a full participant. Uh, he graduated in medicine from the University of Michigan. Uh, he's a certified pediatrician an expert in preventive medicine, trained in infectious diseases and medical virology. Uh, he spent uh, several years uh, at the CDC as a medical virologist where he studied enteroviruses. Uh, he was chief of the CDC respiratory and special pathogens branch and spent time in Sierra Leone at one point during an outbreak of loss of fever. Uh, as you can tell, he is on active duty in the United States Public Health Service. Uh, from 1982 to 98, he was at the University of Hawaii, where he had various professorial titles in medicine, infection, family practice, community health, and so forth. Uh, in 1998, he came to NIAID where he has worked in all aspects of the Institute very closely with Dr. Fauci. And his career over the past 40 years has been to study emerging infectious diseases. So, and he's published extensively and is widely known throughout the world. So we're very delighted that he has uh, uh, picked up the baton and on very short notice, agreed 
uh, to uh, teach us uh, this afternoon. So, David, it's a pleasure, and thank you very much. Thank you, Wynn, for that nice introduction. Can everybody hear me? So uh, the bad news is, you've just heard, I'm not Tony Fauci. I know I look like him, but I'm not Tony Fauci. And um, he did really want to be here. Uh, and he sends his regrets and his, his uh, greetings to all of you. Um, but I'm going to try to fill in for him and talk a little bit about what he wanted to say and a, a little bit about what I normally like to say and make a sort of a, a, a gamish of that. What I'm going to do in the next uh, 45 or so minutes is to tell you a little bit about my world of infectious diseases and Dr. Fauci's world and, and the many, many colleagues um, uh, at NIAID who uh, uh, find it a joy to come to work every day and, uh, and, uh, and, and deal with the 13,000 or so infections that we have to deal with. And Dr. Tremont is here, one of our uh, senior scientists as well. We have a great group of people in the Institute and we deal with these crazy things all the time, these infectious diseases. And we like to say that we're different from any other institute in this respect. If you're the Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, you know, you've only got like three organs, the heart, the lung, and the blood. And the heart only has four chambers. There's got to be a limitation to how many diseases and problems you have. But we've got 13,000 diseases and there are new ones coming on every day. So we have to, we're sort of like, a, there's sort of a firefighting aspect to what we do. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next, uh, in the next few minutes. So infectious diseases are still the major, one of the major causes of death worldwide. You can see here that about 16% of all the deaths globally are infectious. But if we were to be looking at a pie of the developing world, the slice of the pie would be quite a bit bigger. Um, as nations advance, the deaths from infectious diseases begin to decline uh, and deaths, people live longer and they die of chronic diseases. But because, uh, New infections are always appearing. Influenza, Ebola, Zika. Who heard of Zika five years ago? It's, so there's always, it's always a catch-up game. We're getting ahead of infections for a while, and then a next wave comes, and we are all of a sudden getting behind. It's kind of interesting to think that every 30 seconds, infections kill as many people as Jack the Ripper killed in his whole nasty career. Now, I think of, uh, we think, I should say, uh, Dr. Fauci and I have written extensively about this. We think of uh, infectious diseases as occurring in three different categories. The established ones that we've known about for a long time, like tuberculosis. Uh, the newly emerging ones that we didn't know about yesterday, and we know about them now. In 1980, there was no such thing as HIV. That was then, AIDS and HIV were then a newly emerging disease. In 2014, most of us didn't know about Zika, and there had never been a Zika pandemic, and then all of a sudden we had one. And then the third category is re-emerging diseases, ones that have been around for a while, but suddenly they resurge, often because they move to a new geographic area. And West Nile virus in 1999, when that came to the Western Hemisphere, we would call that a re-emerging disease. It had been in Africa for a long time, it had been in the Middle East for a long time, and then all of a sudden in 1999, it simultaneously jumped to the United States and indeed all the Western Hemisphere, and the other way simultaneously jumped eastward into, uh, into Russia. So the first uh, category I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, in the interest of time, I'm only going to mention one established disease and that's malaria. And as I talk about these diseases, I'm gonna just make a few points here and there that will, will recur as we talk about other diseases. And one of the points about malaria is that, you can see the statistics here about how many people it kills, um, 429,000 deaths, 92% in Africa. And that's a pretty terrible number. It makes it one of the leading causes of deaths from an infectious disease and one of the leading causes of deaths in children. But when I came to the NIAID almost 20 years ago, that number was over a million. And we still don't have a malaria vaccine. So as we'll see, um, malaria is an old established disease that still is and always has been killing people going back to ancient times described by uh, Hippocrates and others in the, in the golden age of Greece era. But yet we're making progress in ways that we'll see in a minute right here. Um, 
again, no vaccine yet. There are some vaccines in uh, development, which we'll discuss briefly. But I want to make the point that these great declines, 41% decline in malaria incidence, 60% in malaria deaths, are related to pretty much standard public health things. And I think the point of this is when we think about research and what we do here, you know, we've become, particularly in my institute, very molecule-oriented. We want to have, you want to use molecular tools, genomics and proteomics, to make great new vaccines. Most of the advances in saving lives over the past century have come from public health, not from great technologies, although, of course, they interact with each other. So we have uh, probably the biggest thing in malaria is insecticide-impregnated mosquito nets. The big problem is not to impregnate them, it's to get people to use them. Residual indoor spraying, uh, better diagnostics, better therapy, artemisinin-based combination therapy in which a new drug, uh, dis I mean, new newly discovered by the Chinese uh, several decades ago, in combination with existing drugs for malaria like mefloquine uh, and some others, in that combination, we can do a better job of treating malaria without um, the same rapid development of resistance. Now, as we can see, there are vaccines in development. There's a bunch of them here, and I'm not going to talk much about them except to clarify um, some of the um, perhaps confusing um, uh, terminology here, PFSPZ, that's falciparum, uh, that's plasmodium falciparum sporozoi. That's what it stands for. And um, what it means is that the malaria parasite exists in multiple stages. The mosquito injects a person with the sporozoites, which are a form. Then they go into liver stage forms, merozoites, and then they become released as schizonts. And then eventually they end up as gametocytes and are picked up by another mosquito and goes through the whole mosquito-human mosquito cycle again. So the fact that there are multiple stages of the organism when it's in a human being provides multiple opportunities to target the different stages of the organism. Many of these vaccines are against the sky, against the skies on, but we don't have a really good malaria vaccine yet. But we are making progress, and I have little doubt that before long we'll have really robust malaria vaccines that can be used in combination with the public health measures that we just talked about. And it's, it is conceivable, I think, that even if we can't eradicate the mosquito, and we're not trying to eradicate it now, but even if we don't eventually eradicate the mosquito, we can, if not eradicate malaria, we can essentially eliminate it in some of the worst areas of the world. So that I think that's within our sights. It's not doable right now, but in the foreseeable future, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, it may be possible to turn malaria into one of those background diseases that has a far lower ability to, uh, to infect and kill children. And by the way, most of the malaria deaths are in small children from cerebral malaria. So now I'm going to move on to talk about the more problematic things that we have to deal with, which are the newly emerging and re-emerging diseases. When Dr. Fauci first made a map similar to this at the beginning of the AIDS epidemic in 1981, it only had one dot on it, HIV. And now we have all these dots, and you're not supposed to be able to read these. Um, it's very busy, but the point is there's lots of stuff going on. Almost every year, we have one or two or three new diseases. Sometimes they're very important ones. And I'm going to talk about just a few and a little bit about the principles of why these diseases emerge and what are some of the variables associated with emergence. The first thing I want to say is that almost all new diseases, by some count, 70 or 80 percent, come from animals. Unless you believe in spontaneous generation, which was pretty much debunked about 150 years ago, uh, a new virus has to have come from somewhere. It didn't just spontaneously generate. And that somewhere is almost always uh, animals who are in, which are in the environment. And um, it may be surprising to know, as you can see, that the most dangerous animal in the world with respect to causing the deaths of human beings is the mosquito, by far. The second dangerous animal is other men who can't kill you with a mosquito bite, but uh, start wars and commit homicides and, um, and, and uh, uh, suicide and other things. So human beings are pretty dangerous, but mosquitoes are almost twice as dangerous with, with respect to their ability to kill people. Um, the determinants of emergence of these new diseases, 
I'm only going to spend a little bit. This is a busy slide, but I, it's, it's an important one because the point of it is that it's not sufficient to think of the emergence of diseases as well. Bugs mutate and they're always going to mutate and therefore we're always going to have new diseases. That's true. That's a necessary element of the picture, but it's not the um, it's not sufficient. Uh, and if you look at the list of all these things, I think what you'll see is that the single biggest element in the emergence of diseases is human behavior. We do things to perturb our world. We crowd ourselves into big cities. Instead of being out on the farm where our nearest neighbor is a mile away, we live in an apartment building that has a thousand people in it and we breathe the same air in the elevator. We travel all over the world. We degrade the environment. We deforest our forests. And all these things that we do perturb the ecologic niche and organisms and particularly microorganisms are much more adaptable than we are. They're genetically flexible. They can, you know, if we create 10 ecological niches by, you know, plowing fields and cutting down the trees, there'll be 10 organisms that merge into all 10 of those ecologic niches. And sometimes the consequences won't be good for us. So why does air travel been associated with so much epidemic? Well, this is just a computer generated picture of one day. You're looking at 24 hours of air flights around the world. And what that means is uh, as opposed to a few hundred years ago when most human beings lived and died within 20, 10 miles of, they died within 10 miles of where they were born and virtually never went outside their, their area. Um, nowadays, you can be pretty much anywhere in the world except the top of Mount Everest in about two days. And you can be in most places in the world in less than 24 hours. And there are millions of air flights every year taking everybody everywhere. Uh, and any disease that appears anywhere finds it pretty easy to hop a ride and be everywhere else. So this is one of the major reasons that we have these diseases emerging. Um, the first category of diseases I want to tell you a little bit about are the arthropod-borne viruses, or the arboviruses, and we see a few of them listed here. Um, I'm only going to talk about the two circled in red, which are Zika and yellow fever, because they've caused the most recent major epidemics. But I might want to say something briefly about um, dengue and chikungunya have been around for a long time, but they've both reemerged. We think that chikungunya was in the Americas two or three hundred years ago, but it must have if it was, it must have gone away. And then we had a pandemic, and chikungunya went virtually around the world in, in about in, in about 2013. Uh, and we're still living with it. There are epidemics, and it's, it'll become endemic, but it's still tail end of that 2013 epidemic in all of the, the Americas, uh, all of the uh, equatorial Americas and uh, part of the temporal areas. And then um, dengue has been around for a while, but it's been reemerging. You could say the reemergence started not just in the 1990s, but even as far back as the late 1960s. And the problem of dengue in all of the Americas has just been getting worse and worse and worse. And now, after decades and decades of no dengue, we've had epidemics in, in Hawaii, we've had epidemics in Texas, we've had outbreaks, small outbreaks in Texas and in um, Florida. And then, of course, as I mentioned, in 1999, a brand new uh, arbovirus for us for, in the Western Hemisphere, not new, but new for us, um, somehow, uh, probably in a, in a viremic human being, on an airplane, came from the Middle East to New York City and set off the establishment of a brand new emerging disease, re-emerging disease in the United States and the rest of the um, Western Hemisphere. So before I go on, I think, because I can't answer these questions, but I want to pose the question, maybe you can think about it. Um, why are all these arboviruses emerging all of a sudden? I mean, most of them have been around for centuries and they've caused more or less problems. Zika caused almost no problem, it was virtually unknown by anybody except geeky virologists like me until 2015, and now it's caused a pandemic. Why? Well, we don't know. But here's some things to think about. The um, um, mosquito vector movements, um, the, the prevalence of the mosquito vectors of some of these have just increased as human beings. The, the, the major, the mosquitoes that transmit yellow fever and Zika and dengue and uh, chikungunya is Aedes aegypti mosquito which is a mosquito of human habitation. It doesn't bite anybody else but human beings. And so as human beings get more crowded and collect more water in more junk, they breed in 
tin cans, uh, the mosquitoes breed in tin cans and bottles and tree crooks and flower pots. As we create more of that stuff, we create the environment and the mosquitoes are there and the virus will find them. So human beings change their behavior. Animals like mosquitoes adapt to that and viruses adapt to them. And that's how we get these things. And then we have climate and vegetation, uh, travel and commerce, movement of human beings and goods, shipping containers, airplanes, and urbanization. So Zika virus, let's talk about that. So Zika, Zika has probably been around for a, a long, long time, but it was in a, in a so-called sylvatic or jungle cycle in uh, probably in uh, northern Western Africa. And uh, if you think back 5,000 years ago, the big desert across the top of Africa was actually quite lush and somewhat tropical. And in that environment, uh, the precursor of Zika virus, if it existed, uh, w was being cycled in a sylvatic cycle between monkeys who were jungle, in the jungle, uh, not pet monkeys, but monkeys who lived in the wild, and the monkey mosquitoes, A.D. africanus. And that's all, the, the virus went back and forth Monkey, mosquito, monkey, mosquito, monkey, mosquito. Well, then about 5,000 years ago, the northern part of Africa became desert. And when it became desert, people had more and more need to collect water. Instead of walking 25 feet to the nearest stream to get your water, now you had to store it on your premises. And the, the storage of water on the premises created breeding sites for mosquitoes. So ancestral mosquitoes adapted to their new environment. And in doing so, they adapted away from the jungle cycle infecting monkeys into a new cycle in which they only went people instead of monkey mosquito monkey mosquito monkey mosquito now it was people mosquito people mosquito transmission and the virus is adapted and that's what we have now and that's why zika is spreading it's jumped out of a sylvatic cycle um zika is pretty nondescript as an arbovirus disease because uh seems like half of them look just about like this dengue looks pretty much like it um it's a febrile sort of flu-like illness with or without a rash. You get headache, you get eye pain, you get conjunctival injection, uh, fever, muscle, bone, joint aches. Um, and uh, it, what it doesn't say here, but what it is worthwhile mentioning because it's so problematic, is that about 80% of people who get infected with Zika don't have any symptoms at all. And the reason that's important is because they can potentially transmit it without having symptoms themselves because they don't know they're infected, but a mosquito bites them and gets the virus. And it's just the same as if they were, uh, if they were ill. So it's not clear that illness has anything to do with transmission, but the fact that you have all these people silently infected, how do you diagnose them? You know, they don't come into the hospital because they're not sick. So you can have a fair amount of background circulation of the virus and not see very many sick people and therefore not be able to respond to an epidemic. So the story of Zika is a bit interesting. Um, it's been around, interesting in that it's a complete mystery what happened, and I don't have an answer, but it's clearly been around for a long time. The virus was isolated accidentally from mosquitoes and monkeys in Africa in the 1940s and early 1950s. Um, rare human cases were found. Rare antibody prevalence at a low level was detected. Um, also, in later decades, detected in... Asia and Southeast Asia, but there were no, uh, outside of, in Africa, there were very few recognized human cases ever. There was very little antibody ever. Outside of Africa, in India and in Southeast Asia, there was very little antibody and virtually no recognition of Zika cases. And then in 2007, something totally off the wall happened. There was an epidemic in the little tiny state of Yap, Micronesia, where they have the big stone money that weighs two tons or something. And uh, and by the way, I've been to Yap and worked in Yap. It's a really interesting place, but it is way, way off the map. And all of a sudden, it's the most remote of all the Micronesian islands, I, I think you'd say. All of a sudden, there was an epidemic, and all the experts sort of scratched their head and said, what? How can this be? This, this isn't a virus of the Pacific Islands. How did it get here? You know, you can hardly get to Yap. You know, look at get, ask your travel agent to get you a flight to Yap, and you're going to be in trouble. Anyways, it happened there, and everybody just sort of figured out it and said, well, this is a one-off thing. And then in 2013, again, everybody had forgotten by Yap, Yap, about Yap by then and, and Zika. But in 2013, we have uh, an epidemic in French Polynesia that goes both eastward towards um, South America, 
uh, in Rotorua, then South America, and then westward to the Cook Islands. And all of a sudden, we had a pandemic, and the virus ripped through South America and Central America and the Caribbean. It went all the way across the Atlantic Ocean back to West Africa, its ancestral home. So this virus moved all the way around the world, 17,000 miles around the equator, in a very short period of time, completely unprecedented and off the wall. So we now have all these countries that are uh, uh, affected with Zika, and there are some that you don't see, but Zika is clearly in Africa. It's all over the Central African belt. So, we, but, but since nothing's being detected there, this isn't shaded, but this is now a big problem in a part of the world where it, it wasn't before. And it's not just the fact that it's in the tropics, you know, nor, like Brazil, which is Northern South America, Central America, the Caribbean, but we have all these air flights coming back all the time. 216 million passengers go back and forth from the places where we're having a Zika epidemic. So it's inevitable it'll get imported into, into the United States, and it has been, as we'll see. Now, that's not to say we're going to have continental U.S. Zika epidemics. We're probably not. We're going to have outbreaks, and we're going to have importations. Uh, it's not like you're going to wake up, you're, you're not going to get a call from your grandmother in Boston who's never left her apartment saying she's got Zika. That's not going to happen. But it is a problem. We have had indigenous transmission in Florida in which the virus gets in, finds local people and local mosquitoes, and it sets up indigenous transmission, not related to importation, but related to person A giving it to person B through shared mosquitoes in their household or in their neighborhood. Um, as of uh, May uh, this month, um, we now have in the United States and the District of Columbia, that is the continental United States, uh, and including Hawaii and Alaska, um, I think there is a case in Alaska, actually. Um, over 5,000 cases, most of them travel associated. And then down below in the U.S. territories, and I should, uh, I didn't make this slide, so I apologize. The word U.S. territories is taken to mean both U.S. territories and U.S. US commonwealths. So Puerto Rico and the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands are commonwealths. Um, United States Virgin Islands and Guam and Samoa are territories, but all of those lumped together, uh, and, and a few others, are uh, uh, con constitute the basis of those 36,000 cases, um, almost all of which are locally acquired. So parts of the United States which are tropical, and particularly Puerto Rico, uh, are um, uh, at very high risk and have provided a lot of cases and have a lot of problems. And as I think everybody who's um, you know, off the ventilator knows, um, there has been a, a, a terrible, tragic epidemic of birth defects, um, not just microcephaly, which is a birth defect in which the brain is, um, doesn't develop normally, but a variety of other birth defects as well. And um, this is still going on. There's a lot of things mysterious about it, which I don't have time to get into. Um, but, you know, for, for those of you in the audience who are old enough to remember the 1960s and the terrible rubella epidemic that we have, this is almost like rubella part two. The congenital, and I, when I was in my, I started medical school in 19, in the late 1960s, and I saw rubella babies. Um, I treated them as, as a student and a, later a resident uh, in pediatrics. Um, and this is really the same sort of thing. And it's a terrible tragedy because these kids sometimes are profoundly affected. And I, I don't think what is sunk in yet is these thousands and thousands of babies, many of them will be profoundly damaged and they will have shortened lifespans. They, many of them will require custodial care. Many of them will be unable to be fed in the normal way and to swallow. And they will need essentially full-time caregivers giving them care for the rest of their lives. The, the social burden because of this uh, is going to be huge. And we're just beginning to see the beginning of it now. I don't think it's really set in. So there is what is now called a congenital Zika syndrome. This is not a very profound idea. Um, when, with, with teratogenic viruses, we do see syndromes. Um, in the case of Zika, microcephaly is a bit more common than with some other teratogenic viruses. But pretty much, you know, they differ between them, but pretty much all these teratogenic viruses do the same sorts of things. And it's completely expected that they will um, cause similar outcomes. Um, the, in, in part, microcephaly, the brain is developing around six to 12 weeks. It's developing maximally. 
And so it's probably true. We don't know for this for sure, but we suspect based on what we know about experimental models and rubella and CMV and other teratogenic viruses that um, a child is most likely to have damage to the brain during the time of maximal brain development, which is bet between the time when the cord develops into the uh, preliminary part of the brain and that brain undergoes rapid development. That's in the first trimester, particularly between um, six and 12 weeks. Uh, and as the case for rubella, by the time uh, an infection occurs in the second trimester, the chance of serious permanent damage is far less. And by the third trimester, largely gone. So there's a, there's a window of bad timing to this, which may have been uh, fortu not fortuitous isn't the right word, but the opposite of fortuitous with respect to the timing of the Zika epidemic and all these pregnant women who were infected before anybody was aware there was an epidemic. And as we mentioned, there's a whole bunch of things that happen that are bad with Zika. Um, it's not too different from um, what we saw with rubella. So how are, what's the situation with respect to birth defects in the United States? Well, um, again, this is divided into the two categories of uh, US plus DC and the various so-called territories and commonwealths. And we see that there's been over 1,400 completed pregnancies in which birth defects were monitored as to their presence or absence. And 58 babies born with birth defects and eight pregnancy losses with birth defects, which is which, add, uh, which adds up to 66. Now, it's not really clear what this means because the background rate of birth defects in the United States is said to be about 6%. But of course, most of those are pretty minor things like strawberry birthmarks and things like that. Um, and as this picture is unfolding, it appears that we will be having a problem in the United States. And it's likely that as time goes on, we're also likely to find that they're seeing this in South America, and I think we're gonna see it too, that babies who were born supposedly completely normal had been infected unknowingly. The mother didn't know she was infected. Remember, 80% of people don't know they're infected with Zika. And the mother doesn't know she's infected. The baby's born looking normal, but there has been some sort of damage and that will reveal itself over the first few years of child development into starting into school. Um, so we're likely to see further problems down the road. And of course, there's all these other things that happen to adults. They're not nearly the great public health uh, problems, uh, including Gambare syndrome, which is an ascending paralysis, which is a, a fairly strange collection of syndromes that often follows infections, particularly with, with Campylobacter, the bacterium, and also with, um, with um, various viruses. So a lot of bad news. Some, some of the good news is that we're developing um, vaccines for these viruses. This, this uh, image shows you the development of a, um, of a DNA vaccine. Um, but in fact, we're, we, I mean, we scientists, not just NIH, uh, we are making a number of other vaccines based on vaccine platforms that are different, such as inactivated vaccines, live attenuated vaccines, vaccines that are vectored by another virus in which the other virus has genes inserted for um, Zika and those viruses replicate and immunize, including adenovirus and surprisingly measles virus. They use it, this is being done in Austria. It's really pretty, the data are pretty exciting that you can take a measles virus that's attenuated. Um, people who have had measles, which is just about every adult, is that you do have the infection of the vaccine. Um, it doesn't interfere with the vaccine. They get the measles vaccine and they get high antibodies to the the virus, chikungunya, that was the first one they did it with. Uh, and so, and there's, you know, and there's other vaccine um, strategies too. So there's, there's a lot of ideas, uh, including messenger RNA viruses. There's a lot of ideas for vaccines. And I think that, um, you know, it's very likely that many of them are gonna work. I think that we will have a Zika vaccine fairly soon. Um, however, there is a public health problem, which is this. Zika will soon settle down into an endemic disease, and it'll be like St. Louis encephalitis virus. But is there anybody who knows anything about St. Louis encephalitis virus? It's been in the United States since forever, since before we knew about virology. And it's, so it's become endemic, just like West Nile is starting to become endemic. So here's what happens. The virus, St. Louis encephalitis virus, is all over the place. It happens to be transmitted by birds, which makes it different, but never mind that for the moment. And so the pattern we see now is 
<coughs> hardly anybody sees St. Louis encephalitis virus, except occasionally <coughs> in some place that's completely unpredictable, like Chicago in the 19, uh, Chicago area in the 1970s. Suddenly you have a massive epidemic. No way to predict it. It just appears here, and then it goes away, and then it appears there. So it's, it's, like, a, it's like lightning striking. And what that means is what are you going to do if you have a St. Louis encephalitis vaccine? We don't have one. And one of the reasons we don't have one is not because we can't make one, but the question is, who would you vaccinate? The whole country? You know, you'd be vaccinating 320 million people on the outside chance that a few thousand people would be in the middle of an epidemic, um, you know, five years from now. And you'd have people who had vaccine complications or imagined that they had vaccine complications just because of the temporal association. So that's a non-starter. Oh, I've got up here. Thank you. So as I said, we are starting um, Zika vaccines, and I'm not going to say much more about that now. I think we'll have one soon, um, but by that time, the disease will become endemic. It'll be much less prominent in the process of seeming to go away in the continental United States, and perhaps even in Puerto Rico and the USVI. Um, but we'll never be able to rest easy because it'll always be susceptible to coming back, and it will. Now, yellow fever has been around for a long time, and if I'd been speaking a couple months ago, I wouldn't have thought to even talk about yellow fever. We did have, um, we did have, a, so yellow fever has been an African virus transmitted by the same Aedes aegypti mosquito uh, that I mentioned before, and yellow fever is the original hemorrhagic fever. Long before we had Ebola and dengue hemorrhagic fever and a bunch of other ones that you know about, we had yellow fever, yellow hemorrhagic fever which has been around for centuries, mostly in Africa. And um, just as a historical sidelight, because I think many of you probably don't know this, but um, when our country was a young country, particularly during the years 1793 to 1798, that was during the presidency of George Washington, um, and a capital then was not here in Washington, D.C., it was in Philadelphia. During that time, we had massive yellow fever epidemics up and down the East Coast in all the major cities, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Savannah, Georgia, and all the uh, major cities, port cities, and sometimes even secondarily in the interior cities. And some of these epidemics were deadly. Um, the 1793 epidemic in Philadelphia killed 10% of the population and terrorized the whole country. Everybody who could afford to leave, which meant everybody but the poor people and the ex-slaves, um, left town. The president of the United States and his family left town. The whole Congress left town and moved into Pennsylvania. The president moved into Pennsylvania, too. You can visit his house there in a little town that I'm blanking on the name of. Um, the country left the country during those terrible pandemic years. And, uh, and historians have said that those epidemics and the absolute terror they caused forever changed the character of the American people and who we are now they say, these historians say, is shaped by those pandemics. Incidentally, in Philadelphia, the very first case of yellow fever, which killed a lady, does anybody know where that happened? In the house of the President of the United States, George Washington. His secretary, Tobias Lear, had a wife named Polly Lear, and she was the first fatal case of yellow fever. So it really, you know, was close to home. Well, here's a little bit about yellow fever. I think everybody knows a bit about it. It, uh, it affects the liver. It can have a high fatality rate. Hopefully it's not as high as the slide suggests to you. Um, because your liver's involved, you may get so-called yellow jaundice. You turn yellow or the whites of your eyes may turn yellow. Uh, but otherwise, it's a disease a lot like dengue. And in 2015, um, so and, and yellow fever occurs in periodic epidemics all throughout this belt in Africa. You see the shaded orange, which is that belt. And I might say, incidentally, that belt of yellow fever, coincidentally, is pretty much the same as the belt for Ebola, which I'll talk about in a minute. But the two viruses are completely unrelated, and their epidemiology is different. It's just a sort of maybe a coincidence that the belt is, is very similar. So there was this epidemic in Angola and the Demo Democratic Republic of Congo, the former, former Zaire. Um, it started in Angola and spread to the DRC. Cases were exported to Kenya and to China. 
but the, the, the disease didn't set up there. Um, there were over 7,000 cases totally, and um, only 392 reported deaths, which uh, uh, suggests that it wasn't very fatal compared to the figures you just saw, but in fact, it probably means underreporting and uh, bad statistics. Uh, so probably um, there were a lot more cases, but there were also probably a lot more deaths, or some of the cases were not that many cases. And um, 30 million people had to be vaccinated. And remember that figure in a second, because um, I'll point out to you a little problem in a second. Uh, and so that was Africa. And then all of a sudden last year, late last year and continuing into this year, we started having yellow fever epidemic in Brazil, the biggest epidemic in the Western hemisphere that we've had for decades. There's now over 700 cases with 259 deaths. Again, um, and case fatality 34%. Again, this high case fatality is probably related to the difficulty in getting the right statistics of the number of people who really died of it divided by the number of people who really had it. Both the numerator and the denominator are probably subject to lots of errors, but it's a fatal disease and it's, it's, uh, it's on the downswing now. But so we've had, now we've had a big epidemic right in our backyard uh, in the Western hemisphere of yellow fever, such as we have not seen for decades. The whole world has a, has a stockpile of yellow fever vaccine. Yellow fever vaccine is one of the best vaccines ever made. It was made in the 1930s at the Rockefeller by Max Tyler. And it's a great vaccine. It's, I wish we could make them like we used to because uh, that, that was a, coming out of the gate, that was a great vaccine. However, um, the world has a stockpile of 6 million doses. But guess what? In the Angola epidemic, they had to use 30 million doses. So we have a public health problem here, and that is that, uh, you know, there's lots of fires, but we don't have enough fire trucks to put, put them out. Uh, and in the, the uh, I don't show this, but in the last few months in the South America, Brazil epidemic, they had to use 50 million doses. So we have a problem of, you know, being a firefighter, um, we don't stockpile enough to be of use. It's expensive to make and stockpile drugs that you don't use. They have to be restored. So we're always playing catch up. And the epidemiology and the public health and the prevention aspect isn't, at this point, robust enough to be able to jump on top of epidemics and pandemics uh, as well as we'd like to. And now I'm going to get away from the arboviruses and move to Ebola disease. And I'm not going to say very much about it, but I'm going to show a few pictures that will, I think, tell, sto tell the story that I can't say in words. Um, I was involved, I told Dr. Arias, in the first Ebola epidemic in 1976, and then in the most recent one, 2013 through 2015, I again went back to Africa, in both to Guinea and then another time to Liberia, to, to work on Ebola in that epidemic. And uh, in the meantime, I had lived in West Africa and worked on loss of fever, a different hemorrhagic fever. And so it was particularly um, meaningful to me to be able to see these diseases over a 40-year period and um, and see that um, in, in some ways we're not much farther ahead than we were, but in many other ways that unfortunately I can't talk about, we've made enormous progress, which, we, you, which you haven't seen yet. But I think if, that, when that, if an Ebola epidemic of that size comes back uh, in the future, we'll be, we've learned a lot of lessons and we'll be uh, far better able to deal with it. So here's some of the statistics, which I think you know. These are modest statistics. Uh, other statistics suggest well over 30,000 cases and over 11,000 deaths with a 40% mortality concentrated in these three countries, all of which I've worked in in the past. And just a few slides to look at uh, silently, I'm not gonna say much, um, to make the point that this isn't just an epidemic, it's a human tragedy. And it should be looked at as a human tragedy, not just a bug that people like us are supposed to be able to control. So of the many good things that came out of this, if anything good can come out of an epidemic like that, um, and uh, it, what I'm gonna say is not on this slide, but we, one of the vaccines that we've begun testing, a VSV vaccine, a VSV is a vector of a non-human virus in which we insert genes for Ebola, um, has proved effective. And um, if we stockpile it, 
we can use it again if there's another epidemic. How we'll use it isn't clear. Probably what we'll do is vaccinate healthcare workers in, and other essential people, like people who do burials in the affected areas. We'll ring vaccinate around patients when somebody becomes sick. We'll go to their neighborhoods and vaccinate all around where they live and that kind of thing. Uh, but down the road, what would be an ultimate vaccine strategy for dealing with this is hard to know because, again, it's like the situation I described with Zika and with St. Louis encephalitis virus. Z uh, Ebola occurs over an enormous tropical belt, an enormous geographic area, and you don't know where it's going to pop up. So what do you do, vaccinate everybody? You know, they have a 2 or 3% birth rate. You've got to be vaccinating. It, it's an ongoing thing because there's always new kids. The average, the average age of a person in this area is about 20 years old. And, you know, you've got millions of kids being born every year, and the, the vaccination has to go on and on forever. And most of these people will be vaccinated needlessly because they won't happen to be in the place where an epidemic is going to occur. So we do, but we do, have, we do have at least one good vaccine. And as you can see, we're testing a number of other vaccines, too. Um, good data came from a second vaccine that doesn't prove efficacy, but it, it suggests we're um, really making a lot of progress. Um, and I think that I, I want to also say that the things I don't have time to show, but we've learned a lot about the natural history and pathogenesis. We know a lot more about why people die from Ebola. And it's, it's not what we imagine. Uh, I said the yellow fever was the first hemorrhagic fever. Most of the other hemorrhagic fevers aren't necessarily hemorrhagic. You can totally die of Ebola without having any hemorrhage, and the same is true for Lassa and all the other ones. So these are systemic, overwhelming viral diseases in which multiple organs are damaged and you have multiple organ failure. You may also have uh, an immune response that causes additional damage. Um, we're learning about this, and it seems to me at least, and I've, other people I think agree with me, that probably the single major reason people die of Ebola is from vomiting and diarrhea. That is to say they have a cholera-like illness. Well, we've known how to treat cholera for a century now, over a century, um, with fluids and electrolytes. And um, it's, in, it's interesting to know that in the first Ebola epidemic in 1976, the mortality was about 90%. In this recent epidemic, for people who were in West Africa, people who were put into Ebola treatment units. And by and large, they didn't get anything but supportive care. They didn't get IVs. They didn't have respirators. They didn't have good laboratory work. They just had good nursing care and good monitoring. Their fatality rate in general was in the range of 40%, less than half. Of the 27 people who were airlifted to the United States or Europe, some of whom were on death's door, were more abundant with no blood pressure, their mortality rate was 18%. So that suggests that if we could find a way to bring intensive care unit type treatment to the places where Ebola occurs, and that means oxygen, respirators, maybe ECMO, all these things that we have, you know, a few hundred feet away, but they don't have in Africa. If we could do that, Ebola could potentially be brought down to a serious, but, but ultimately usually not fatal disease. And now we have a new epidemic of Ebola in the DRC, the place where it has been recurring the most often in its 40, some 41-year life. And uh, it, this is a moving epidemic in the northern part of DRC with um, uh, 19 cases so far, and we're probably going to see more. Okay, influenza. Um, I think we all know about influenza. It comes in pandemics every 30 years or so. And after the pandemic comes, a lot of people get sick. Many people die. 1918, there were probably 50 or some say 100 million people died. The most fatal event in all of human history, worse than the Black Death in the Middle Ages. Uh, but most of them aren't that deadly. But they do always come back. And, um, and after they come back, they stay around for a while, and they mutate and become what we call seasonal influenza every year, and they drift and they mutate to become a little different. We have to get a new vaccine every year, and the vaccines aren't perfect. Uh, and one could go on and on. I sometimes talk for an hour or two hours about that, and I'm not going to do that now. In the United States, we have a, as many as 60 million cases of influenza a year, as many as 700,000 hospitalizations. Many of them, and nowadays, you don't get hospitalized for flu unless you're really, really sick. And um, I might want to say that... Uh, um, some of you in the room knew our 
our former director of my institute, Dr. Richard Krause. Um, two years ago, when Richard, just at the time that Richard celebrated his 90th birthday on January 4th, we had an epidemic of a new mutated H3N2 virus. And the vaccine didn't cover against it very well. And the head of one of our flu labs and myself and Richard all got influ Richard Krause, our former director, all got influenza at the same time. Jeff and I, uh, my colleague and I were so sick, we had to be bedridden for about a week, both of us, and we were really, really sick. And we thought about trying to go in and hospital ourselves. And Richard, unfortunately, died. So this is influenza. It's, it's one of the deadliest diseases, and the vaccine works least well for the people who are most at risk of severe and fatal disease. And as you can see, we have, the actual figures are impossible to get, but most people say somewhere between 24 and 36,000 deaths every year with a range because it fluctuates of 12 to 56,000 deaths a year in the United States. Um, and I wanna mention, this just tangentially, it's not just human influenza viruses we worry about. There are multiple categories of influenza viruses that we worry about. There's the human ones, and then influenza is also in pigs. They get it from humans. We give, that, we give pigs the, our virus, and then they mutate it and change it, and they give it back to us. And then we have epidemics of pig viruses. And partly that's what happened in 2009. Um, there is also um, ongoing influenza in horses and in dogs and in other animals. Um, and the natural reservoir of these viruses, all influenza viruses not so long ago, came from wild birds ducks, geese, and shorebirds, by and large. And it's worth pointing out that with respect to influenza virus, poultry birds, chickens and turkeys, are completely not the same as wild birds. The poultry, is in, uh, poultry like turkey and chickens, are secondary hosts, just like people are. They're not natural viruses of these. And so when the virus gets into the poultry, it mutates and goes down a, an evolutionary pathway that it can't go back down. So although, yes, we worry about H5N1 and H7N9, um, which are poultry viruses that are transmitted from poultry to poultry, and they do spill over into humans, and they do sometimes infect and kill human beings, these are probably not gonna cause a pandemic because they're, they're not adapted to humans. And, and probably, so with respect to H5N, H5N1, which uh, some newspaper people are saying is the deadliest flu that ever existed, 60% fatality, what they leave out is that probably 20 million people have been exposed to these virus and only a few hundred have died. And they're probably people with genetic susceptibilities. Uh, in other words, the virus can't infect most people. A tiny percentage of people have some genetic susceptibility not identified yet. Part of it might be IFM, IFITM3 gene mutations that confer a susceptibility we, we know to flu and other viruses, and there's probably other ones as well. Uh, and so these are a totally different picture for us. And then of course, where does the pandemic virus come from? Well, the, the most recent pandemics have come from previous viruses. So that the pandemic of 57 and 68, those were descendants of the 1918 virus. But the 1918 virus genetically looks completely bird-like. So did it come directly from a bird, a wild bird, is that possible? Or did it exist in some intermediate host we have no idea. So the, the, I, I call these viruses like 1918 founder viruses. They're viruses that come out of the blue from nowhere, and they're very much like bird viruses, wild bird viruses. And then they may seed the reassortment of the genome, other downstream viruses that can cause newer pandemics, as happened in um, 1957 and 1968. So we're now... Um, making a vaccine for, um, this is Dr. Fauci's slide, he wanted to talk about this. Um, because we can't be sure, really sure, that these poultry viruses can't cause a pandemic, because they can be deadly. I mean, 60% fatality rate, I can stand up here and say it's very unlikely this virus is ever gonna get into people and spread, but the odds may be low, but the consequences would be pretty bad. So we gotta make a vaccine. So we do have stockpile vaccines against H5N1. Now H7N9 has been mutating in birds, not in people, in poultry, not in people. But um, now we have to make a new vaccine. Every time we go through this, we, um, it's like jumping through a new hoop. And so we really need to um, do a better job in having better vaccines. 
and we're making better vaccines, as I'll show you, and we're studying them in various uh, we, uh, NIH, NIID. We have these vaccine treatment and evaluation units around the country, and they exist for the purpose of us conducting clinical trials on a very fast basis. And in fact, this is a slide put together by Julie Ledgerwood of our Vaccine Research Center that shows that in the 14 years since the SARS epidemic, our ability to make a rapid epidemic pandemic vaccine has gotten much shorter. The SARS vaccine took 20 months to make. The first Zika vaccine took a little over three months to make. So we're doing this as fast as is humanly possible now. And this is the time from when you start making it till the time it goes into the first human being in a phase one trial. The idea has arisen that we wanna have a universal influenza vaccine, whatever that means, um, because it may be really technically impossible to have a truly universal vaccine that protects against every influenza virus you could see from people, from poultry, from other animals, um, you know, directly from wild birds, whatever. But there's a number of potential targets that um, we're looking at, including the, um, the hemagglutinin, which is the major, one of the two major surface glycoproteins. Um, the epitopes on that are the ones that mediate neutralization when we have neutralizing antibody. And also the neuraminidase, which I would love to talk about, because I think neuraminidase immunity would be really powerful, but we're not doing too much to work on that now. Uh, and we're doing various vaccine strategies to make someday a universal, or at least a more universal, or a closer to universal vaccine. The last thing I want to talk about, Dr. Fauci was going to talk about HIV AIDS. Of course, he's one of the world's experts, and um, I'm not, so I'm not going to say that much about it. But uh, it is an interesting case because it was a re -emer it was an emerging infectious disease in 1981 when it first appeared, and we do not have a vaccine, and we're not close to having a vaccine, and that's the bad news. But there is some good news. We're actually able to do quite a bit with public health. So here you see that um, new HIV infections globally among people who are above the teenage years, over 15, um, has dropped and partly because of PEPFAR and other things I'm gonna show you in a minute, but we're, we're actually making a dent through public health mechanisms where um, we're, we're getting out, the, the HIV epidemic is still going on, and in some places it's still increasing, but in other places it's going away, and it's, we're now at the point with, with uh, antiviral therapy that people who are diagnosed with HIV and treated early and stay on their treatment and don't have really bad side effects so they have to get off it, have pretty much a normal life expectancy. Remarkable. The number of people who are receiving this therapy has grown astronomically since the, in the last uh, 15 years, or at least up to 2000, with 17 million people, almost half the, half the people in the world who are infected on treatment. And it's estimated that that has saved 8.8 .8 million lives. But what's in our toolbox to prevent HIV? Um, you're looking at a, a diagram here, which has a whole bunch of little things, uh, little arm, little blue arms coming out of the combination HIV prevention toolbox. And it has a bunch of stuff like treatment and prevention, uh, clean syringes, male circumcision, treatment as prevention, um, a couple of which I'll explain in a minute. But at the bottom, I want to ask you for extra credit. How many of these are standard public health approaches and how many are high tech things? Well, the answer is, all but two of them are complete public health approaches. Um, we have gotten on top of the uh, HIV epidemic by using the standard public health approaches that we would use for other diseases. And in fact, almost everybody, I think including Dr. Fauci, well, I shouldn't speak for him because I didn't ask him, but I think most people in the field believe that in theory, in theory, not in practice, because it's not gonna happen, but in theory, we have the tools to completely eliminate HIV you know, decades down the road without a vaccine. We have the not, we know how to do it. And here's some of the ways we do it. Treatment as prevention. Um, because it's a transmissible disease, if you treat people who have it and bring down their viral load, they're less likely to transmit to others. And then the incidence of disease and the new infections go down. And in fact, here's an example of just how that worked in Baltimore, in which this is sort of a funny slide, but um, 
Oh, I'm not sure this pointer is working, but never mind. But anyways, the blue, so the blue is suppression. It's going at the blue line is going up from left to right, meaning that the virus is being suppressed. In other words, the line going up is a good thing. You're get, when you start to get rid of virus by treating people, their viral load goes down and they're suppressed. They're twice as suppressed as they were before treatment. And at the same time, the incidence in their community has gone down from 35 to almost zero. So, uh, you know, the, the effects of just doing simple things like finding everybody and treating them is remarkable. And then there's pre-exposure prophylaxis. Some people have lifestyles that put them at risk continually, multiple sexual partners, particularly men who have sex with men. Um, and, you know, it, it may not be possible that, you know, the government is very powerful, but we're not powerful enough to change people's sexual behaviors. Uh, but what we can do is um, give them pre-exposure treatment. You know, take a pill. That's the way it works now. Take a pill every day. And, um, and then you can do whatever you want to do. You can go to the, you know, you can go and have multiple sexual partners. And you don't have to worry about it because you're probably not going to get HIV because you've been prophylaxed. And here is some of the medicine that we use in, in pre-exposure pre prophylaxis. It means uh, taking a pill, uh, but uh, the pill is licensed and it's available and it's, I think, affordable for most people or, and probably most people get it um, for free. And now that we're, uh, now we're doing a study, we, NIH, is doing a study in which we're trying to get, um, we're trying to see if an injectable drug that lasts for eight weeks, you get a shot every eight weeks, uh, and it has a different drug in it than the Truvada, than the, than the pill. Um, try, and, and we're trying to see whether that will work and whether it'll be acceptable, more acceptable to people. Because the kind of people who are running around having multiple sexual partners are not necessarily the people who are going to remember to go home every night and take their pill. So what if you could just give them a shot? I think people really, people um, who live in, in these, they have these lifestyles very often, in my experience, are much happier to have a shot. Than they are than they are to have to remember to take the damn pill, um, and they may you know they they go somewhere else they leave the pill at home they don't have it you know whatever, uh, so this is being studied in a number of men who have sex with men and and transgender women, uh, and uh, we will know in a year or so uh, how uh, how it's going, and finally um, what about an HIV vaccine? Well, I would like to say that we're making progress on that. I don't think we're really very close, but we have some really cool ideas which I don't have time to discuss very novel vaccination strategies in which, for example, we figure out how the HIV virus mutates while infecting people long term. It mutates to escape neutralizing antibody, and then different neutralizing antibody comes and blocks that virus, and then it escapes the second neutralizing antibody, and so on. The virus is mutating down a pathway, and if we know what that is, we can take those immunogens in the sequence and serially or together immunize a person early on in their infection against the virus that's in them right now and the repertoire of what it's going to try to produce down the road. In theory, will that work? Mm, I don't know, but it's at least a novel idea. Um, so in closing, I, I just want to say that from all the stuff I've said, um, we're, we're kind of, with respect to these re-emerging diseases, we're sort of in a delicate balance. These, these agents can just mutate and appear all the time. They're going to keep coming. There's nothing we can do or will be able to do in the near future to stop them from coming at us. And our tools, our, our measures to deal with them, are public health measures, biomedical research, such as the research done right here at NIH and other great places around the country and around the world, and development of countermeasures. It, it turns out that uh, human beings are about 98%, and actually it's probably more like 99%, identical genetically to chimpanzees. And our nearest ancestor that led to separate lines of chimpanzees and humans was about uh, 8 million years ago. One or 2% genomic change that took us 8 million years to do, many human viruses can do that same degree of change in one day. So they have a competitive advantage. They can mutate way faster to get around us than we can mutate. It's not gonna, we're not going to outmutate them. And so that's a terrible challenge. And Josh Letterberg, our, our late colleague, um, who was, a, who was a, a friend and, a, of course, a um, friend of NIH and also a grantee of NIH, uh, said the future of humanity and microbes likely will unfold as episodes of a suspense thriller that could be titled Our Wits Versus Their Genes. And let us all hope that one day we'll read that book and put it down knowing that it had a happy ending. Thank you.
in here. Yeah? Thank you. That was a great talk. Um, I had a colleague who asked why, who complained that they got sick every every year from some kind of flu or something. And I said, why don't you take standard precautions that you should have learned about? So my question really is, what are we doing about teaching people standard precautions against getting sick every year that they should be learning about? Well, you know, it's <laughs> it's hard to answer that question because I, from my, people ask me that question all the time. Why don't you do more? Well, you know, my answer is, I've spent my whole life trying to educate people. I talk, you know, it's on the CDC website, it's on our ed website. I go all over the world talking about this, and so do tens of thousands of other people. So, you know, I don't want to I don't want to blame the victim, but I think part of the problem I don't think the whole problem is that the message isn't out there. It's uh, part of the problem is that the receptivity to the message is not there. And particularly in in my opinion in the in this internet world, um, people want to be commanders of their own knowledge. They want to go on the website and see what Jenny McCarthy says. They don't want to come to a talk I give and listen to what I say. So I'm competing with, you know, a bunch of nutty information um, as well as less than perfect information. Um, and how we get around that, this is a, the answer to your question is a social answer, not a medical answer. Um, prevention, in, let, me, let me say state this in another way. The information about prevention that will do the best job possible in preventing all these diseases is out there and has been out there for decades. And tens of thousands of people every day are communicating it all over the United States. And why doesn't it get heard? I'm not sure. But it's, I've been struggling to deal with this issue for my whole professional career, and I don't have an answer. Hi, my name is Pearl. Um, thank you for your talk. I have a follow-up question to that and perhaps um, one potential uh, explanation for maybe why it's not reaching everyone. So I spent this year doing a, a project on online resources for sickle cell in particular, but this is definitely applicable to all sorts of conditions. And the idea there was to assess the readability and suitability of online materials for sickle cell, so including that from the CDC, different organizations through the NIH, et cetera. And we found that, you know, knowing that the average American reads at a seventh grade level, most of the material was written at a ninth grade or above, right, with the highest being 14th um, grade. And then when it comes to the suitability aspect, it just being most materials not... Um, made in such a way that the average American can comprehend. So I'm curious, you know, what if any efforts are made towards making these materials online more plain language or because you think about like who is making the website, right? And these are experts who are well trained and have a certain level of expertise. But when it comes to the public, you know, what are we doing to make it accessible to everyone. Thank you. Yeah, it's, um, I, I have um, some sympathy with the point you bring up. I, you know, I go to websites too, and I have to say that in general, not picking on anybody, but in general, the CDC websites and the NIH websites and some of the other authority websites are not that helpful. Um, and it's not just only because of the aiming at too high a level. It's like you can't navigate them. You know, you can't find what you want to get. So you give up. I think that's the worst problem, by the way. But, but with respect to the, you know, level you're talking at level, uh, question, I have sort of mixed feelings about that because the knowledge of needing to speak in plain language and the necessity of doing that and the training of educators to do that has been well-known and well-practiced for over 50 years. This is not some new problem where people realize, well, I had a college degree. You mean I have to talk like a 12-year-old? No. We knew, you know, we knew that when I was in medical school. We learned that in the 1960s. Um, we learned, for example, as doctors, we learned how to not use doctor talk to people. And when, when health educators were involved, they knew very well what the level of understanding was of the populations, including minority populations that use slang terminology or, you know, not upper white middle class terminologies for things. 
And all of that knowledge was all around me in the 1960s when I was starting off in science. So if, if the problem still persists, it's not that the knowledge of how to do it isn't there, it's that somehow the system is failing. And I don't know how, why that is, but it's probably worth looking into. Um, New, newspapers, for example, um, all the major newspapers uh, uh, aim for, even the Post and the New York Times and the big ones, they all aim for making sure that things are understandable to, a, to the average 12-year-old. Now, I don't think they always do that, but they always aim for that. And um, most newspapers do a pretty good job of explaining things, um, particularly things that where the reporter has time to think it through and, you know, do multiple things. So if the newspapers can do it. Why, why are we not doing it? I don't know. Um, do you think there's a potential in the use of uh, new technologies such as the CRISPR-Cas9 system as an antiviral uh, therapeutic, particularly given that HIV is a retrovirus and so is going to be latent in the genome uh, for some time? Yeah, I, you know, I'm not a gene jockey, so for those who don't know, the CRISPR-Cas9, I mean, th these techniques are brand new in the last two or three years, and the, I think everybody thinks they're very promising, but how they'll play out, I don't really know. I'm very optimistic, but I, I'm not smart enough to know exactly how it works to be able to say what value it's going to bring us down the road. But I think it's an exciting time, and every indication is that these new techniques are going to do a lot, if not marvelous, at least really, really good stuff. Is that your feeling too, or? Not very surprised about the feeling. Well, but you know, it's getting there. It's moving very, very quickly. If you think about other technologies that came along, like in 1980, monoclonal antibodies were a new technology, and um, we didn't really know where it was going to go. But within five years, six years, seven years, it became a standard technology, and virtually every university had labs, you know, central lab services that made monoclonal antibodies. So, you know, things change, things move. Um, you're, you mentioned Max Tyler. I wanted to know what was terrific about his, his, uh, his vaccine for yellow fever. And also, um, is it not antithetical to think about a universal vaccine um, in, given the, the dance between species where we're always adjusting and changing and finding ways of, you know, where viruses Find a way yeah, let me let me answer your second question first. I, I use the term universal vaccine because it's in the it's in the current conversation. I actually don't use it, and I am mildly resistant to that resistant to that term because I think it's a phony term that convinces us that you know there's going to be a magic bullet. I don't think there's going to be a magic bullet. I think we have to move forward towards better vaccines incrementally, and I don't think we'll ever have a universal one, but we might have halfway universal ones or three quarters of the way universal ones. So I agree with you. The one, and, you know, I might want to say that one of the things that sort of irritates me about science in recent years is our ability to get captured by all these buzzwords and flavor of the month concepts. Um, it, it really prevents thinking. And when I compare our current generation of scientists, nobody in the room, of course, to the generation that were my elders when I was starting in science, I think there's a lot less critical thinking nowadays and there's a lot less big picture thinking. Because scientists, uh, particularly in the PhD programs, are more narrowly trained. You know, you've got to be an expert in this tiny little molecule, and you don't have to know anything else. And so you really know you're the world's expert on this one tiny little thing. But, you know, someday there might be another problem you have to solve. And whoops, you know, I didn't learn that. I was telling Dr. Arias that when I was in my training, I was trained as a physician, um, that my colleagues who were in PhD training in microbiology, when they got out of their microbiology PhDs, they were well-trained, fully functional virologists, bacteriologists, parasitologists, and protozoologists, and immunologists. They knew it all. That doesn't happen anymore. So the, the siloing of education and knowledge, I think, is a huge problem, and it leads to some of these uh, problems we have in not moving quickly enough, I think. And your first question was about Max Tyler. Uh, what was so, and you, I think you said, what was so good about the vaccine? Well, it was good because it worked. Um, it's one of the only vaccines you can give one standard dose and you get lifelong immunity. That's almost unheard of for any vaccine. Um, with some footnote exceptions that I probably don't have time to go on into, it's almost perfectly safe. And, and, and I would say, with the probable exception of extraordinarily rare individual host susceptibilities 
and people get bad reactions to the vaccine. It's really pretty rare, one in millions and millions of cases. Um, it's one of the safest vaccines ever made. Cheap, safe, it's been the basis of uh, uh, completely successful public health programs. It works in individual protection, it works in community prevention. It's one of the best vaccines ever made by virtually every way you count it, I think. And Max Tyler was just a very humble guy from South Africa who came to New York and, and sat around and just did this vaccine quietly throughout the 1930s. This was in the very beginning of the virology era. They didn't even have tissue culture in those days. He did it in mouse brains and in, uh, and in uh, chicken uh, cells. You mentioned that Egypt is, is the number one killer of humans. Uh, is your institute funding genetic attacks against the reproductive system of that mosquito? Well, first of all, I didn't say that Aedes aegypti was the number one killer. I said mosquitoes in general were the killers. And Aedes aegypti is one of the major ones, but um, um, Anopheles gambiense and some of the malaria-carrying mosquitoes are probably much more important. Um, but we have funded sequencing of the genomes of those, uh, both of those organisms. Uh, Anopheles gambiense was, I think, the first um, mosquito that we funded the sequencing of the whole genome. Uh, and... Um, I, you know, I don't know enough about the mosquito portfolio to know exactly what we're doing. I, I don't think I can answer your specific question. There are others who know that, um, but I better not say anything because I might make a mistake. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Thank you for a great talk again. Um, you mentioned uh, a lot of airplane flying contributes can contribute to epidemic, and there was a lot of concern that during Olympics, the Zika epidemic will get out of hands, but it didn't seem to happen. Why you think? Um, um, but maybe we have yellow fever epidemic now. Uh, do you think Olympic contributed to that? Well, you know, there's no way to know for sure, but I think the evidence is consistent with the idea that the the Olympics actually had nothing to do with anything. And a couple, a couple of reasons why. There, there is virtually no recorded cases of people who went from somewhere else to the Olympics and then went back and had got a Zika infection. It almost, it almost didn't happen. Part of the reason is because obviously they knew there was Zika there and the whole premises, the compounds and the hotels were just completely cleaned out of mosquitoes so that, you know, the risk was probably pretty low. Uh, also, the... Um, the uh, Olympics, I think, were in, in Hio, and the, the major focus of the Zika cases were in the northeastern areas uh, along the coast. And um, so Hio de Janeiro was not the major place where it was there, but it was not the major place. There were cases there. There was an epidemic there, but it was not the major place. And secondly, with, with respect to yellow fever, the areas where yellow fever is most active right now are not the same areas where Zika is most active. Yellow fever is being transmitted in Brazil, mostly in rural areas through spillover from the, the end zootic cycle, not from person to person transmission through 80s mosquitoes. So it's a little bit different. There's a lot of reasons that, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here, but I think that um, very few public health people suspect that the Olympics, despite all the massive air travel, travel um, had a major impact on the course of the epidemic or of yellow fever, which happened a year or so later. Hi. Um, so it's somewhat fortuitous, I guess, the timing of this rescheduled discussion, because I don't know if you've seen the cover of Time for this week, but I'm discussing not. how uh, an infectious disease pandemic is really sort of like the next big threat that we should be concerned about. And um, I'm just wondering, from a policy perspective, how do we, um, I guess, make sure that our um, representatives and um, funders are appropriately allocating for future events? Um, because, as we all know, you know, funding is the life lifeblood of research. Well. Um... You know, that's, that's why they pay Dr. Fauci the big bucks, because he deals with Congress and the White House uh, all the time. I, you know, let me just give you, I, I can't speak to policy. I, I can't speak for Dr. Fauci or Dr., Dr. Collins on this, but let me just make an observation. I think that, in general, Congress is well aware 
of the threat of pandemics. And they have funded us, maybe not in the way we would like. And if you think about it, you know, this is sort of a funny time because we have just come through a period of almost 10 years in which everybody's budget took a hit because of the recession. And now we're just coming out of that. And now we have a new administration that so far hasn't indicated the same level of enthusiasm for pandemic control. Let, let me be, you know, kind in saying it that way. But so I don't know what the future is going to hold. But I think that to, another another thing I want to say that is not directly answering your question, but is, is kind of um, background for that is that I think because of the Ebola epidemic, the whole world has developed another, has elevated its awareness of pandemics an, a, another notch. It was a big wake up call. Now, the, the thing is, Ebola was never going to come and cause a pandemic in the United States, but it so scared people, they thought, gee, this could be the big one. What if we had it right here? And they got scared. And so finally, for the first time in my lifetime, the world is getting together. And when I say the world, I mean WHO, new organizations like CEPI, you know, NGOs, a whole bunch of big thinkers, philanthropists are starting to get together in a gradual way and saying, you know, we've been Mickey Mousing around too long. We need to think of pandemics as a potential threat to human existence. And we have to have the same high level response to them that we have to nuclear threats and other threats. I think that's beginning to happen. And the fulcrum of it is not necessarily in our government, but we're, we're, in, we're in the middle of it. So I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic that the game has been changed primarily because of the Ebola epidemic, but of course all the other things that have been going on too, they're sort of cumulative and Zika was a, a reinforcement for that. You know, I've been I've been going around the world talking about pandemics and emerging diseases for over 40 years now. And everybody gets excited by cool slides of epidemics and stuff. Then they go home and yawn and forget about it. I'm beginning to see now, just in the last couple of years, that people, just regular people, not science people like you guys, but just people out in the communities are really getting interested in this. Like, they're thinking, this is not your thing that you do off in some laboratory. This is like our thing too, and we want to be involved in it. So I think that's very good. I'm guardedly optimistic. Um, I just had a quick question. Um, so you've talked a little bit about flu A and the different types of flu A, but um, so I, I weekly follow the CDC flu data, and there are still hundreds and hundreds of cases of flu B every year. Um, and it's not as complicated with the different types of hemoglutination and everything. Is there a reason why we still haven't been as successful in controlling flu B or? Well, for one thing, flu B is basically a children's virus. Uh, it's much more, you know, flu A, I mean, everything is an adult and children's virus. But, you know, I think you could say, this is just a gross generalization. Flu A is a uh, problem for almost everybody of all ages. And flu B is disproportionately a disease of children. Children are less likely to get vaccinated. Uh, and um, children have behaviors that spread these viruses at a much higher level than adults do. And remember that none of the vaccines, are not, well, so the, the vaccines we're talking about are one vaccine usually with three or four components in it, one of which is flu B. And the, the vaccines are nowhere near 100% efficacious. And um, that means they're not highly efficacious for flu B either. So even if you could vaccinate everybody, a lot of kids would be unprotected and because of what they do, they all, you know, they gather together in school rooms and in gym and all that stuff. You know, it's just very hard to get rid of it. We don't, we don't have any flu vaccine that has the capacity of significantly eliminating influenza viruses yet. But we could have that someday. All right. Well, those who have questions or want to talk to Dr. Morins, I'm sure he'll be here for a while. But I think it's rather symbolic, David. We start out with the Brooklyn Bridge which I didn't give my usual speech about, but the intent is that <clears throat> that crosses between science and medicine and disease, and life is never the same on the other side of the bridge. And we wind up with Dionysius holding the light to the future. I can't think of a better <laughs> example for it. So thank you very, very much. Thanks for coming up with an analogy and a metaphor that I hadn't thought of. Thank you. <laughs>